folks. Welcome back to another episode of the Texas Signal Signal Cast. I'm your host, Joe Desotel. I'm here with my co-host, Jessica Montoya Coggins. Hello, Jessica. Hey, Joe. And we are fresh off another election night in Texas. So we had the constitutional amendments. We had a runoff for a special election in the House in San Antonio. Uh, a couple of very closely watched ballot propositions in Austin anything going on in north texas in terms of did you guys in dallas have anything to vote on big we just had those constitutional amendments um so that was sort of the major thing for us uh that we were watching um but you know i was i was very interested in seeing what was happening in austin and again that house district race that that you mentioned um you know overall i think most of the nation was fixated on virginia for some Mm -hmm. obvious reasons uh but you know, for all the bickering about, you know, progressive, moderate, blah, 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 blah. My understanding is Austin actually notched quite a progressive win. Do you want to let us know a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And all the talk, half the talk was don't Texas my Virginia. Uh, But I saw one uh, journalist from Houston basically make the point of, uh, well, it looks like Democrats lost in Virginia, but progressives won at least here in Austin. So, uh, so yeah, don't Virginia on Texas, I guess. Um, but uh, in, in Austin, we had Prop A, which was a follow up from last May, which was Prop B that dealt with homelessness. And this is the same group, right? They're called Save Austin Now. They are led by the local GOP chairman, who is the founder of this organization. It's his vehicle to essentially uh, make the city council look bad. And that's what he's used it for successfully with Prop B, uh, where he, he lodged his victory. It turned out it looks and looks like a fluke. It looked like sort of a fluke at the time, and it's looking even more like a fluke after they're, uh, they got wiped with the, uh, across the floor with Prop A. And Prop A was about police funding. And essentially, the city of Austin moved about 100-something million dollars uh, from under APD, Austin Police Department, to other social services, basically take some money from uh, response and put it into prevention is what the thinking was there. Then during the session this year, the legislature passed uh, a bill that essentially told cities they could not defund or move or alloc- reallocate funds from police departments or Uh, the state would stop giving money to the cities or something like that. But essentially they made it illegal for them to do this. And so the money that had initially been moved from APD had already been put back in the APD's budget. And then some over 10 million additional dollars had been put into APD's budget, which is about 40% of the city of Austin's budget, 40% already. What Prop A would have done was tied the number of police, active duty police officers to the population uh, at two per 1,000. This, uh, you know, according to them, this was some kind of national standard after uh, the local NPR station looked into it and started asking questions. It turned out there was no standard and they could not back that claim up. And there were just a number of lies that they were telling throughout the campaign. Um, but it looked like Austinites knew and figured it out and they're very smart. Uh, you know, they pull a George Bush basically like fool me once, you know, don't get fooled again. And uh, so, you know, Save Austin now did uh, have that win last May, but uh, they were unable to uh, get a second win on this my, one. Now, my understanding is to this champion, um, he was, I believe he said if this didn't pass, he was going to move. So. Matt McCobiak. Yes, the chair of the local GOP said that he told the statesman that he would consider moving uh, if this didn't pass. Uh, oh, hit but the road, Jack. <laughs> I, yeah, you know, I think we could have a, a, a packing party for, for Matt, but he actually on election night said he's not giving up. He says, I can't save Austin tonight, but I will keep working and eventually we will save Austin. So probably, thank God right. well, better from ourselves, time. right? Yeah, from the voters. Save the voters from themselves, Matt, please. Um, and so, I mean, we're talking the final numbers were something like uh, 67% to 32%. It was just a shellacking, two to one, um, 80,000 something votes cast. So um, people knew what they were doing. They knew what they're voting on. Uh, both sides, um, you know, ran significant campaigns. The interesting thing was a 
closer to election day, once early voting started, um, there were a series of, uh, you know, Nazi themed sort of protests that had happened in the city of Austin, including one where they got pictures of the APD officer fist bumping one of these dudes with a swastika on his, on his hat and on his shirt. That made a lot of people mad. And here we are, you're asking people to go vote to give you more police officers and just entrust you with more public money. Um, and so that obviously not a very good look. Um, and you couple that with the fact that the folks who are running the campaign for Prop A um, were making a really big deal that George Soros had donated money. Uh, and we know from previous campaigns all over the country that George Soros is often used as sort of like this anti-Semitic boogeyman when it comes to money and his involvement. Even people saying all kinds of crazy rumors about him, like he was a Nazi sympathizer, even though his like, you know, he literally, you know, escaped Nazism uh, as a Jewish man and his family. Um, and so, um, and so, yeah, there was just a lot of just really icky things that were going on with this campaign. And I think Austinites, uh, you know, where they educated themselves enough and, and they figured out what was going on and they, and they went out and they voted two to one. Um, and so he, he's, um, he's gearing up for his next move. And um, I think that, you know, we'll see. He's got some plans. They're talking about who they're going to run for mayor and all this other stuff. But I think right now they're still, they still feel a little bit, you know, a uh, bit and a little hurt. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly a good result for, for Austin. Um, I guess we should sort of point out that in the special election for this state house seat, this is sort of San Anto a little bit south of San, San Antonio and a little bit south, um, uh, John Lujan, a Republican, mm -hmm. did defeat Frank Ramirez. Uh, so this was a special elect election. So obviously turnout was way lower than, you know, even uh, elections which typically trend very low in Texas. Um, what did you think about that? And because I know that, you know, immediately Abbott, Paxton, Patrick, they were all crowing about this. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. First, I think you're right to point out where the district is. And, and it's basically the outer portions of the city of San Antonio are in Bear County. And I think it's completely within Bear County, but it kind of circles around the city of San Antonio and grabs a lot of the southern part. But, um, you know, the way I look at this is there's going to be another election between now and the time that whoever represents that seat goes to the next legislative session. So in some ways, this is like an intramural. This is like a moral sort of, uh, uh, you know, victory or loss, depending on what side you're on. But and in Ramirez's case, I would say, um, you know, this is why Republicans like Greg Abbott put special elections in the middle of the year is to get this type of result. And so this was actually not even a, norm, a normal election where you had a Democrat run and then a Republican run in a primary and then you have the top D and R. This was a open, like basically jungle primary style uh, special election where the top two vote getters were in this runoff which uh, it was a runoff that was on in, in November. And so, um, you know, there will be, you know, we have the primaries coming up in March and then there'll be another election for this same seat next November. And, um, and then whoever wins that will go. So I think the bottom line is, I do think that whoever it is, whether it's Ramirez or some other Democrat will probably end up taking the seat back before the next legislative session. So they're gonna get, you know, Patrick and Abbott have to get all their celebration out right now while they can celebrate with the folks in Virginia about how, you know, and try to form a narrative like they always do. So to be expected. Yeah, so um, it looks like all the, the constitutional amendments passed. So everybody in Texas, you know, uh, that was on the ballot for them. You know, um, there were a lot of different ones on there. We talked about them on the signal about which ones were good and bad. Um, but like I said, they all passed good and bad. Um, but I think it's important to note that we have a legislature in the Republican Party who runs it, who constantly talks about too much government, too much government. And every single year, almost every time we're voting on five, 10 different constitutional amendments. And that's a lot of them in part because 
they're afraid to make strong decisions on certain things that could be potentially controversial. They'll do anything if they think the right is behind it. But if it's maybe a good thing, but it could scare some people on the right, they will just, well, let's leave it to the people. Then they'll put it up for a constitutional vote. So that gives them cover so that the people have to actually go out and do the legislating because they're afraid to do it in these instances. So I just think that's worthy of pointing out because our constitution is an absolute mess. I mean, there are so many amendments to our constitution, just it's ridiculous. Uh, most states, uh, you know, periodically will actually uh, rewrite their constitutions. Uh, but I feel like Texas, because people A, don't know anything about government uh, and they're so hung up on, you know, just the mythology of Texas that even though we did rewrite one as recently as maybe I think the seventies or something. I have to go back and, and fact check myself on that, but I know we've done it before in Texas, but it's been much longer than typically, I think a lot of other States and the way our constitution is just, it's just like a, you know, jigsaw puzzle of, of constitutional amendments that at this, at this point, I'm sure there's some contradictory ones, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyways, um, but, you know, there are some folks um, on the move. The, um, the, the uh, filing is open for office, so people are going to be running. I literally just got a text here right now I'm getting from Greg Kassar. Um, I have Greg's number. He texted me. So this is not this is from his campaign, clearly. But he's announced that he's running for U.S. Congress. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is going to be, we're probably getting lots of these types of texts here in the next couple of weeks, especially if you're on the voting rolls as a, as a Democrat. Um, so yeah, well, I know you talked with Greg when he had the exploratory committee and it was a really great conversation. I, I highly recommend folks uh, go to, to uh, listen to that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, officially making the, the jump into yeah. being announced candidate a lot of seemed a lot of uh, folks were, were cheering that on, uh, you know, a lot of prominent people in the Austin area. So I think, um, you know, I know that there's other people that are filing, looking at that seat, because um, that is the open primary down mm -hmm. in Austin. So I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll be seeing a lot of names. Yeah, there. I mean, it is. And I, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's one of those seats that it, it hasn't come up for 20 something years because Lloyd Doggett has been in this, in that seat. And Lloyd Doggett is not still not going anywhere. It's just that they drew another seat. So Lloyd Doggett is going to run for the new draw, newly drawn 37th district. Uh, and Kassar is running in 35, which had previously been occupied by Doggett. And so we've, we, this one, this one, like 35 before it does go, well, I guess 35 before the last redrawing does go all the way down in San Antonio. Uh, and so whoever represents this district in Austin is going to have to um, also represent basically the 35 corridor you know, San Marcos through all the way down to San Antonio. Uh, so that means that they, there could be somebody from San Antonio who gets in this race. I know that TMF, Trey Martinez Fisher, a state rep who previously ran for uh, state Senate and lost and then ran again for his house seat uh, and won it again. He's currently a, a state rep in San Antonio is looking at this uh, we believe because it was reported that he had told the chair of the redistricting committee to draw him in to this district, and they did. And so we all speculate naturally that that's because he, he wants to run. Um, but I haven't heard any update on that recently. Uh, but this morning I did hear that current state representative from Austin, Eddie Rodriguez, is considering running for this seat now. He had talked about it, but he's officially filed some paperwork. And so that paperwork will allow him to, you know, have, you know, have a treasurer and raise money, you know, because even an exploratory committee, you can spend money, right? You can start to talk. Um, you essentially are. And I don't, I don't know that that's even a technical term in Texas, but the, the idea is you are, um, you know, haven't officially announced, but you have to have a treasurer on file to start raising and spending money. Uh, so it kind of allows you to do that without saying you're totally in it. And uh, yeah, Mike, Mike Collier utilized that. He was at the exploratory committee. Uh, this is one of the lieutenant governor candidates. And um, so, yeah, yeah, it sort of gives exactly. you that sort of a little wiggle room, but it allows. Yeah, you. sure, exactly. And so much to the point that when he announced, people were like, wait, what? <laughs> we already thought he was running. So, um, but 
Uh, another uh, big announcement, though, for statewide office, uh, Rochelle Garza is an attorney, uh, formerly, I believe, the ACLU, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, yes, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yes, okay. And so now she's running for attorney general. She mm-hmm. claims on her Twitter, because I was just reading her announcement and stuff, that she has in the past uh, gone up against, and I don't know in what context, but Kavanaugh and uh, Ken Paxton in court and one is what she said. Uh, so that's very interesting. I'm sure we'll learn more about her and that as, as time goes on. Yes, yeah, she is definitely, uh, especially in her capacity sort of with immigration. Um, so that was, because uh, we know that Paxton has sued many a time uh, mm-hmm. about this. Um, so she, she, has, she has done that. And t- yeah, I was excited to see that. I think that'll be a very, um good you know we've got some good candidates there with her uh lee merritt joe jaworski these are for attorney general Mm -hmm. um so we'll we'll see as of now our primary is is not that far away so no we have three candidates a very diverse slate for attorney general but we still have zero from governor we do we do so We need I to am, send up like the Beto signal or something. Yes. Oh, that's like, really good. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's really good. I hadn't seen that one, but we uh, they should. They should. I'm, I'm gonna actually. I need to contact. Uh, we'll, we'll talk with Ben about that. He can make a graphic or something. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> they should do like a little from the, the top of the signal. building a Beto Beto <laughs> signal. Um, yeah. I mean, calling you know, calling all potential gubernatorial candidates. Um, you know, we have other roles to fill too. I mean, there are a lot of statewide offices in the state of Texas. Uh, so um, you know, and I think we could talk a little bit about that too. Like, I personally don't think that we should have that many um, because it 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 leaves no one really truly accountable because then you have to know because one because the governor could say oh well i didn't that's the lieutenant governor or, or that's the uh comptroller or that's you know and whatever if you in other states where it's the governor has has like you know and it can appoint people then the buck always stops with the governor and and he and if he doesn't get rid of somebody or or change a policy then the then the voters can get rid of him so uh i always think that you know the way things are with these Republicans that we, we have in there, they're pretty slippery. So we got to keep, um, keep tabs on them. Um, but, you know, one of the big things obviously that Paxton was known for was, um, you know, the insurrection and being there and trying to help Trump overturn the election. I thought this was interesting. This happened today. Uh, Jenna Ryan, who had flown from Texas in a private jet to the insurrection, took pictures in front of it, talked all this crap and smack on social media, including that she would not go to jail because she was white blonde. and had, yeah. yeah, white skin and blonde and and uh, not going to jail. She going to jail. So <laughs> she she was those are famous. Perfect. Those are very famous last words. Oh, and I have so to. Good. I just have to say, if you this is also a legal thing. So like, if you are in trouble. Do not tweet. Do not do any social media. Just keep your keep your mouth shut. Keep your fingers away. Just mm-hmm. just a heads up for anyone out there. But but yes, uh, Miss Ryan, uh, I believe she's uh, in her daytime or, or in her non incarcerated time a uh, <laughs> real estate attorney yeah. she's from Frisco. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, North Texas kind of led the way in terms of the number of insurrectionists that we had. Um, it's uh, a bit sad um, and i bet there were a few more over the weekend because of a specific event that was going on in dallas this is your uh, hometown i'll let you talk about it uh yes <laughs> so um for those that, that did not see uh it's fine i was actually at daily plaza yesterday um but on earlier this week uh there was a q anon rally um so for those that aren't familiar q is has basically been sort of telling all these people that you know the storm is coming there's this whole sort of underground pedophile ring and tom hanks is in it and hillary clinton and barack obama and all these other hollywood celebrities um but a big thing also with this organization is that jfk jr is actually alive and he is getting, he's imminently coming to return. He's actually going to be Trump's running mate in 2024. 
Um, you can sort of Google the person who claims to be JFK Jr. at this point. You know, I just kind of do remember what JFK Jr. did look like before he tragically died, uh, you, know, 50, uh, 20, you know, over 20 years ago. Um, just that, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but so yes, there was this QAnon gathering at Dealey Plaza, you know, waiting for JFK Jr. Needless to say, JFK Jr. did not show up. Um, but it was pretty, I think, frightening for a lot of people. Um, there, you know, it was not a, a small crowd. Um, it was pretty sizable. Um, you know, they were lined up, sort of. You know, and, and obviously, <laughs> Dealey Plaza has a very tragic history there. Yeah, um, the guy's so, dad had his head blown, blown right, there. Right. So, um, so that okay. yes, that cool. that occurred. Um, and fi- I actually I had jury duty recently, and um, the courthouse where I was at is was right across from Dealey Plaza. So I actually went, you know, sort of walking around, and I did not see JFK Jr. So no. So I mean, but it, all these pieces fit together. I mean, and you're you're right. I mean, you got this woman from North Texas. Um, you know, going to this insurrection because they believed all this stuff that Q was talking about. They are the storm, right? Like the storm is coming. We are the storm. Um, And so they believe this. And so that's why they did what they did on January 6th. And here they are still active and still, you know, showing up. Now, what happens next now that you know, I saw one video where they interviewed a guy and they said, well, okay, so Q said all this stuff about you know, Robert F. Kennedy coming junior coming back and Trump is going to be reinstated as president. What do you now that that's not happened? What do you think? And he said, well, I think Trump is president. So, I mean, (laughs) every time I think I feel like Lucy in the football, I'm like, well, this time they're going to see that it's all crazy. Well, I mean, it doesn't help to, you know, our attorney general Paxson, who you mentioned was at the insurrection, spoke at the insurrection. He referred recently to, uh, you know, Biden, basically Biden's in office because of an overthrow. Um, He is adamant that this was a fraudulent election. He will, you know, he'll be in crowds where people will talk about that and he will agree with them. And so that is, that is frightening. I mean, this is, and somebody asked this this very question at a rally, but I, I actually had the same question. At what point do they stop talking and start doing something? Because if they believe this was overthrown and they believe that they've been collecting all these guns for all, for to overthrow the government in case the government goes out of control and they think Biden stole the election, at what point do they actually start acting on all the stuff that they promised us they would do if this were to happen, the thing that they say happened, even if it right. didn't, you know. Right. What- yeah, that, that video comes from Turning Point USA. Um, so that is a, it's supposed to be an, an organization. It's fronted by a, mm-hmm. a young man named Charlie Kirk, but it is going around college campuses, you know, encouraging younger people to be Republican. It's funded actually by a lot of Texas donors, uh, Doug Deason in particular. Um, but yes, there, there was an individual who, as you were saying, basically said, you know, when is it time for us to take up arms? Um, now, Charlie did sort of talk him down from that, not necessarily, I don't think in necessarily an altruistic way. It was more just, you know, we have to sort of wait and do this uh, through passing crap laws and all that. But um, no, I mean, it is, it is very frightening. You, you sort of see a lot of this rhetoric that is, that is scary and escalating. Yeah. And a lot of it coming from the top, the top corridors here. So, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. but well, but well, Jenna Ryan will have 60 days to think about what she did. That's it. I know. Just 60 oh, days. come on. All right, fine. So, all right, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. She'll surely we'll get back on Twitter in 60 days and we'll report. We'll have a report for you guys. <laughs> what's, what's she doing? What's Jenna Ryan up to? We'll have Jenna Ryan watch. Um, I'll see if she's still blonde. I don't know if they allow uh, hair dye into ooh, jail. It's not even natural. Um, but, you know, speaking of keeping tabs on folks, so this, you know, part of the the claim, you know, Republicans did so well in this last election was uh, the critical race theory stuff seems to have actually genuinely moved the needle and caught on with folks and basically scaring the crap out of them. And I've seen a lot of videos about this too, where Folks can't define it. They don't know what it is. They just know it's bad. 
and they 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 don't want it being taught in these socialist schools and like oh my god they really got something with this and it's scary um but then we're starting to see the next iteration already and that looks like um Krauss and Abbott going after libraries and what what books are there and now you've talked about this and even before this became their talking point you were talking about this same issue and writing about it books that had been you know pulled out or or people you know who were supposed to speak about their book not been able to do so what do you think about uh all this Abbott says he wants to get rid of all the pornographic material that's just flooded our libraries since he's been you know running the state I guess I don't know yeah, where were you when all this happened? I guess Abbott, like, how did you let this happen? Um, yeah, no, I mean, for the last couple of months, I've really, you know, I noticed that this critical race theory, which again is not taught in schools, it is a legal framework uh, from law schools, really. Um, but I noticed that this this phrase it became sort of like this catch all that they were using uh, when when they did not like something being taught, um, and. You know, I, I do think it had a, a big a big thing in Virginia. There was also, um, I think, a lot of panic about uh, trans students. There was a really unfounded story that made its way through the right wing sphere about that. Um, but with critical race theory, this is something that they have clearly, you know, realized they have leverage over a lot of people, and it it I think it was a motivating factor for a lot of white parents who are very afraid. And, you know, I think this is going to continue. They've realized that this, that, that this was effective. Um, so, you know, the, you know, Krauss was asking about 850 books from these different school districts about whether they have, you know, now Abbott is asking, you know, what about this pornographic uh, material um, to which uh, sort of a lot of the state agencies were like, you know, we're not really the, the best people to do, do this, um, but this is going to continue. And it's, it's a really, it's, it's shameful and it's gross and it's, it's really very gross. vile. It's very vile and gross, but it's, it's something that they realize is, is effective. Yeah. And that's really sad that it's exactly what it is. It's effective. And they're pushing him further and further because, you know, he's been in government in the state of Texas for 20 years, you know, as attorney general, he could have done something about this if this was a problem. Uh, as governor uh, for multiple terms, he could have done something about this, but only now when he's in this primary and all this stuff is coming up and he's just, he, he has no ability to stand up to these folks and he has no willingness to stand up to these folks. And so they're just pushing him further and further and he's he's just kind of going along with it. So yeah, it's it's pretty scary. Um, you know, I had hoped when when the inevitable of this stuff started bubbling up, um, and you know, from all their insane rhetoric, that they would have to start slowing that down and start saying, okay, you know, in the vaccine stuff, when the people started dying, you thought, okay, well, surely their own people are dying now because they bought into this. They're gonna slow down and and they just don't they accelerate and so it's it's really scary to not have a clue where we're gonna sort of um end up um with with this kind of stuff but well that's quite a bit uh i, was I do to... i do want to say uh so we we do record this on uh thursday mm -hmm. afternoon and just literally <laughs> when you were talking about prop a if i looked like i was not listening i really was but uh, the the Biden administration has sued over Senate Bill One, uh, our voting rights, the voter suppression law. Uh, so that oh. just happened over. Good, good, yeah. As, as we were as we were chatting. Nice, excellent, breaking news. Uh, well, it's good, you know, because that's what has to happen. You know, that's what the legislators went to D.C. to do was to advocate on, on behalf of federal action for voting rights. And we need it. And we have only ever gotten anywhere on, with federal action on voting rights. There was no states rights that, that were pushing voting, uh, you know, access uh, to to folks. It was always the federal government that did that. And that's why. Folks like Abbott hate the federal government so much because they're always just extending rights to the people they don't want to have them. And so 
Uh, yeah, unfortunately, the Senate is, you know, rem you know, the filibuster remains an impediment towards passing something like the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. You know, people forget this, but when LBJ was able to pass the first Voting Rights Act, there actually were a fair amount of Republicans that voted for it. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of been lost in history, uh, including uh, Driscoll, uh, you know, who has a Senate building named after him. But uh, we don't have those people anymore. So we are truly... Uh, you know, we, we, we need the, the federal government to, to, to step up. Yeah, well, hopefully uh, it'll get to the right court um, and who knows where it'll, it'll end up, but I, I'm hoping it gets pushed, you know, um, to a, a less conservative court that is over politicized and, you know, sort of on the take here. Um, and then, you know, sure, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll look for some, uh, some more silver linings. Um, I guess the only one I could see is that, uh, I have, I've hear Elon Musk may end world hunger. That could may be. end world hunger. He has to see sort of proof there that it would work. But. Sure. As long as they were being transparent with him, um, you know, um, so Elon Musk basically tweeted, you know, and we can talk about Elon Musk because he's an Austin resident, right? I mean, he's a Texan now, right? So, um, even though, yeah, he's trying to escape and get to Mars as quickly as possible. For now, he's 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 a resident of Texas, um, but he basically tweeted out that I think it's the UN. Uh, if if they he would pledge six billion dollars, he would liquidate Tesla stock to to pay for it if they could prove to him that their plan um, would actually end world hunger. So this is one of those kinds of things where I don't know. I feel like he's he's been acting up a lot lately. Like I don't know if you've seen his. Some yeah, of the tweets. I mean, well, he he is, I believe, recently separated from from his wife. So maybe that. Well, also... he wasn't ever married to Grunts. It was uh, well, recently girl. separated from his his girlfriend, I guess. Then, yes. or, uh, yeah. so you know that, that that happens sometimes when you are newly single. There are things you start to do or say or act um that are a little out there um but no know, but he, has, has yeah he literally been. made 13 billion dollars in one day like you know i guess it's not all about I, money but. i will also say that um i am of the aoc opinion that there should be no billionaires uh but for elon musk and this is very disgusting six billion is actually nothing for him so if he did just want to say, here, UN, here is six billion, you could even call it the Elon Musk food program. There you go. Um, yeah. I mean, I, no, I totally agree with you. I mean, even if even if there was a 50 percent chance that it wouldn't work. I mean, you're talking about ending world hunger. I mean, like half of pageant contestants, when they ask them, the what would you do? I mean world peace are in in hunger like the yeah. two probably most popular answers so you know um it's just it's just weird to say something like that if you're not really intending on doing it you know i feel like it's too important of a thing to just be that flippant about um but he's always been sort of that way i mean this was a person he was pretty much sort of run out of california for sort of you know he always talks about you know, they were just shaking me down for all this stuff. But yeah. really, he's just very anti-union. He yeah. had, there were some really bad things, especially with the COVID policies at that factory. Um, so there was, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, no, himself, he, he himself, you know, was has cast out on the virus. Yeah. Um, I basically, I just, I don't know if it's a real term, but I just call these people techno-libertarians because that's basically what they are. They believe in technology as a solution um for everything um and they don't really believe in government and they're basically libertarian um i mean I you know right there yeah and a lot of people will point out that he's gotten a lot of money from the federal government for all his 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 companies he's gotten many many grants well yes and even joe biden he has a lot to jo uh, joe biden was very instrumental for the car bailout of 2008 in 2009 and that's i mean uh, so without that uh i'm not sure tesla would certainly not be where it is today who knows if it would even be a solvent company oh that's interesting i didn't even know about that one um but mm -hmm. yeah that's that's interesting so you know yeah I, I, it's it's always it's always annoying to to hear to hear that people forget where their money comes from once they have it 
Um, and all we're asking is just pay your taxes, like pay, pay taxes. Like you, nobody's nobody, literally nobody went to him, at least that I know of and said in world hunger tomorrow, like, but we do say pay your taxes. So that, that will go a long way towards that. Um, and so anyways, yeah, I don't want to get too hung up on that, but I just think it's weird. And then he tweeted the other day um, that he was going to start a new school in Texas. Did you see this one? The Texas Institute I, of Technology. I did, I huh? did see that. I, yeah. did see, I, I, I follow Elon Musk. Yeah. Okay. Right. But then the governor retweeted him right. and it's just, it's just, you know, I, 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 I used to be able to tell when things are done in serious or in jest or how serious people were when they were doing something or saying something or when somebody really genuinely screwed up and didn't mean to do something but i have no idea anymore like it's impossible to tell impossible to tell what greg abbott knew when he retweeted this guy or if he was trying to be cool or if he really thought he was going to start a university with the acronym t-i-t-s like who knows who knows i don't you know, in many ways, the state of comedy has been killed by people like Elon Musk, uh, especially I think the time he hosted Saturday Night Live. I, it's I'm true. Gonna, who I would actually wager he was a worse host than Donald Trump. That is sort of when you know, like, it's just yeah. gone very downhill. And and, the, and to your point about the state of comedy, comedies had to go so far off the deep end, yeah, that it's like, getting kind of dicey you know uh, somebody people, actually you know, recently there i guess a couple months ago joe rogan dave Chappelle, and elon musk were all hanging out and someone refound that photo and was like this takes on a much darker meaning now yeah yeah but, yeah they're the real li the lizard people i think um but uh okay well, well that was a jam-packed episode there yeah <laughs> it turned out to be yeah um but we'll we'll continue to follow you know as as people um you know run for office and and, and we'll have more candidates next week we'll have more candidates in them in the following so the deadline ends uh sometime in the first week of december uh so up until then we will we should be getting some surprises um and figuring out who's who's running for what as people still kind of dissect these maps and make decisions so, you know, keep it tuned in to texassignal.com. We appreciate you listening. Um, you know, we're everywhere you listen to podcasts or um, hang out on social media. So find us there and we certainly appreciate it. And um, yeah, until next time. Later. Bye, guys.